I'm Leslie Ann Warren, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From. Well, I did it. I finished the morning show this week. <laughs> I needed to let you know that I literally had been saving the last episode as discussed. Of season two? No, season two isn't even out yet. It's season one. Look, I told you I'm a year behind on these things, but it's how I operate. And when I got into the morning show, as I said on this podcast a couple weeks ago, it changed my life. I couldn't believe the tone. Adina Porter herself said the tone of the show is wild. I saved the last episode. And I have to tell you, the whole thing is like so dark and strange. But then there are moments of levity that come. And it's like the show doesn't quite know what it is. And so I For the first 30 minutes of the last episode, I was like, why did I even think this was fun? This is so stupid. Like, it's so self-serious. And then the last 30 minutes delivers so wholeheartedly. (laughs) I was screaming at the television. It is so strange. To me, it ended in this moment where I feel like a lot of plays and musicals end when there were live plays and musicals happening. And it was this thing that annoyed me in New York theater where every show would end with a sharp intake of breath. Do you know what I'm talking Mm. about? Like, it was like how Eliza ends Hamilton Uh you know and it like is like the lights on her and she just goes and then it's lights out and then the crowd applauds and I'm like I hate it I saw like 18 shows do it it's a terrible ending that's how the season finale of the morning it's it remind it right it was reminiscent of it I really highly recommend I know that you're gonna watch an episode and be like that was amazing and then watch another episode and be like well that was a waste of my time you have to stick with it you got to get to the end it's so weird and I'm saying here once again that Jennifer Aniston is giving the best performance on the series and I like Reese Witherspoon I think she's a great actress I like Jennifer Aniston I think Steve Carell's a good actor Reese Witherspoon is like screaming hysterically (laughs) or puking like every other episode she is at 11 and Jennifer (laughs) Aniston is also at 11 but like I don't know she's more grounded for me I loved I loved every second of it even the moments where I was like this is terrible because then the swing back into what the fuck is happening in front of me is so good so I highly recommend it it to me is musical in its unevenness and i just i can't wait for season two wow i mean i was really not expecting that and also you have told me have told all of us that this is like smash but not quite and it's not quite smash it's not quite smash and then you told me i think privately that it was closer (laughs) to studio 60 on the sunset strip which i hated i had so many issues with it i did too but i think that was maybe a more accurate assessment of tone because that show also thought it was very clever and knowing and then it would be like sarah paulson doing a holly hunter impression and you're like this is hilarious literally the only thing i can think of is that impression and then it would be like the war on terrorism effects like studio 60 on the sunset strip what i hated about that show was i think you called it with the morning show self-seriousness what i hated about studio 60 on the fucking sunset 360 the title first of all i can't can't remember remember it but what i hated so much about it was the like the state like they thought the stakes were so high so when they were doing their very like signature sorkin walking down the hallways like talking about sketch comedy in (laughs) parallel with like the war on terrorism i was like this is supposed to be the BTS of like a showbiz show. So right. I need you to not think it's that important because that like takes away like be more nuanced about like the parallels. But like I can't have this like I don't even remember who the writers were. Bradley Whitford is somebody, right? I, yeah. And Matthew Perry, I think, is like the show. Runner. He, of course, it. has like an Oxycontin addiction and it's supposed to be parallelized. Anyway, 30 Rock came out the same year and it was like, this is Armageddon and Deep Impact all over again. <laughs> I ended up with 30 Rock. But anyway... Hi, and welcome (laughs) to another episode of You Might Know Her From with Damien and Anne. Hi, I'm Damien. Hi, I'm Anne, and we are just coming in hot on this rainy Sunday afternoon. Well, it's great to be here with y'all. It feels like it has been a while since we've been here, although it's only been a week. It's only been a week, but let's be honest, we're coming up on one year in quarantine, Mm. so that is wild. But thank you for sticking with us. As you know, we interview an actress each episode. We used to do it live. We used to do it in person, sometimes in their house, sometimes in our house. Sometimes that got weird when actresses would come over to our apartment. You never knew what you were going to get. But we've been doing it on Zoom since I think last May we started, or in the summer. We started doing Zoom, and I feel like we've hit our stride. So thank you for sticking with us. It's been a real roller coaster, but honestly... It's been great because we've been landing huge names. Yes, we've been landing huge names and that feels like such a coup. I feel like we are 
forever changed now, you know? Yeah. I'm going to pause here in case you want me to edit this out. But (laughs) can I say that when you talk about us having, you know, we used to have people come to our apartments. Yes. And when I was doing some cleaning in my apartment the other day, I remembered an an actress who I'll keep anonymous (laughs) said to me, like, where's this artwork from? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I think I bought that from Target. And she was like, hmm, we need to get you some other artwork that's not from Target. And I was like... (laughs) Okay. She, I think she liked it. And then she heard it was from Target and then she didn't like us. Yes. Yeah. That's literally what I thought of it. I was like, oh, I should have yeah. lied to her. I was like, I think yeah, yeah. I should have been like, oh, it's from this amazing, like queer artist. My, me yes. and my roommate like picked it up at like this auction in Brooklyn. And she would probably yes. like text him and be like, what was the name of that artist? And I would have been like, oh. Yeah. It really was just. It was like got- a per- perfect example of that, which you said. I, I was like, oh, she liked it. And then when I told her it was from Target, she was like, and I was like, oh, I should just lie. Like people lie sometimes in the, just because they don't want to have those types of conversations. But I was trying to be like self-aware and self-deprecating and be like, oh, I bought like a three set from Target because we needed something on this wall. And she was like, hmm. <laughs> We need to get your artwork that's not from Target. Okay. Buy but then on the alternate side, you had some actresses coming to be like, oh my God, how much do you pay? You have a two bedroom to yourself. <laughs> Incredible. And so then it was, you know, like I felt like you got, we got the full spectrum of, of the experience with the actors. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now th- things will forever be changed. Who knows when we'll be able to record in person again. And when, if, and when we are able to, I'm going to say when. Yeah. I now have another little goblin that lives in my apartment with me because I've adopted a dog. So Ah, there's a dog here. He's putting it on the record, folks. He's putting it on the record. Tell us about your dog. I have a dog. She's a pit bull mix. She has no time for your nonsense, but she's super cute. And her name is Ronnie, short for Ronette. Cause she's a street urchin and um yeah well she'll you'll probably hear her eventually and it honestly it eventually will happen and at a certain point we're not going to want to edit her out so eventually you'll hear her in the background i'm just going to say damien had been looking for a dog for most of quarantine my partner and i had been sending him lots of dogs he was looking for a under 20 pound dog with a specific type of face <laughs> and he ended up with a 50 pound pit bull so <laughs> i could not be happier she is beautiful I think she's always in a full tux and she wears spats, which I like. Mm -hmm. And she has freckles and really floppy ears and she's very sweet and Damien loves her. And uh, I think she's a great addition to the podcast. So welcome, Ronette. Yeah. Marie Bellino. It's very nice to have you on the pod. Yeah, she's our intern. So (laughs) now you'll know when we refer to Ronnie, the intern, you'll know who that is. Sometimes an actress says yes and you shit yourself. We are huge fans of this week's guest. She is very important to both Damien and I, to our childhood, to our adolescence, to our adulthood. We're talking, of course, about Leslie Ann Warren. And when we got the yes, Damien just sent me a text message. It just said, email, all caps. And that's when I know that something incredible has come through. And that's how we (laughs) felt when Leslie Ann Warren said yes, because we had been courting her for a long time. We're not Los Angeles based. It never worked out when we were in LA. And now that we're on Zoom, we got to talk to the legend that is Leslie Ann Warren. She is the star of Clue, which is so important to us. She is in Victor Victoria and Cinderella. She's just at the heart of things that feel central to my heart. Absolutely. I mean, honestly, like even listening back to the interview while we were doing the edit, I was like, I, it's her voice is like, it's Miss Scarlet. And I know that's so stupid and she's an actor. Yes. And I, yes. but it's like, I was like, wow. <laughs> I still feel excited that we like got it. And we're going to be fully transparent that the audio quality is a little bit compromised. But when a legend says yes, and you're obsessed with the legend, you make it happen. So we're sorry, offer us a little grace in that respect. But honestly, this was a total dream come true. Leslie Ann Warren was, I think, down to clown, you know, a little bit. You might know her from Clue, Victor Victoria, Cinderella, Choose Me, Desperate Housewives, In Plain Sight, and Will and Grace. We are here with actress, dancer, singer, Oscar nominee, Leslie Ann Warren. Leslie Ann Warren, thank you so much for being on the show. We're we're really excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me. This should be fun. Yeah, well, you don't know what it's going to be yet, right? But we're gonna, hoping... It- <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> okay, so we're going to come in as we sometimes do a little bit hot. We just need, we need you to know that you appear in one of our favorite movies of all time, which is Clue. 
for our listeners, this murder mystery comedy stars Tim Curry, Madeline Kahn, Michael McKean, Eileen Brennan, Martin Mull, Christopher Lloyd, Colleen Camp, and of course you. Anne and I love this movie. I, I feel like we could sit here and just ask questions about like your line readings, about the bits that you do, but I, we will spare you some, I think, of the, like the minutia. The question I want to know is that I, as I was doing research, the writer-director, Jonathan Lynn, said that Carrie Fisher was originally slated to be Miss Scarlet, but allegedly she checked into rehab sort of days before rehearsal, and then they ended up getting you. I never knew this. I am dead for it. Hearing that you joined the cast a little, maybe a little bit late in the game, can you explain how Miss Scarlet came to you? And like, were you skeptical? You know, you were coming off the heels of your Oscar nomination. Like, were you scared to take on this role? Was it nerve wracking? What was it like? No, it wasn't nerve wracking at all. I actually was in Greece with my family, my son and his girlfriend and my mom and an assistant and a dear best friend of mine. So we were, I was in Greece and I was on vacation and, and this, this call came in and I knew nothing about Carrie Fisher getting a role. I, it just came to me. And later on, I learned that she was going to do it and then allegedly checked into rehab. It was just fun. I mean, I read it and I thought, oh my God, this is so much fun. I didn't know the game. Like, did you join when everybody else got there or was every, were they sort of like already on set and rehearsing with the director when you came on board? When I came in, I came in with kind of everybody else, and we all were starting at the same juncture. And one of the things that Jonathan Lynn did was he had us all meet at the Paramount lot and one of the screening rooms, and we watched His Girl Friday as a group because he wanted us all to have that that affectation of that sort of 1940s way of speaking and the speed and the particular kind of humor that was inherent in that movie and many movies of that time. So we really started off together. I mean, nobody, nobody had anything, you know, on me. We all started together. So the film notably has three different endings, but it has long been rumored that a fourth ending was shot, but that Jonathan Lynn didn't like it. This alleged ending has Wadsworth being the murderer of all the victims. He then poisons all the suspects, but is attacked by a dog as he tries to escape the mansion. I think I'm getting this right. Is this true? And do you have any stories about this never before seen ending? You know, I'm not, I was not even aware of that. Did Jonathan say that we filmed it? Because I don't honestly remember filming the fourth ending. I remember filming the three endings. But I never, this is the first time I've heard of that. So, so you have information that I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was like a script that he, that never made it to like the final draft. Maybe, maybe. And you know, scripts change as you're shooting. You know, they sometimes add scenes or delete them or change them or, you know, so maybe that was an idea he had that never came to fruition. I also read that like I that Mrs. Peacock got like shot in the in when you guys filmed it, and then that was like re-edited after the fact. Is that true? Not to, <laughs> not to my knowledge. I don't remember her being shot. I don't remember that at all. No, I think, <laughs> Clue fans are nuts. Like, yeah, I think that's made up. That's a conspiracy theory. No. <laughs> okay. Like, one of the things that I loved so much re-watching the movie was remembering that Miss Scarlet is so delighted by all of the reveals that come in the final act of the movie. When you read the multiple endings, did you try and track as an actor what was actually happening? Or did you just sort of go with the rhythm and the energy of the piece? Or did you really know what was happening in the moment? You know, I had a character that I had created in my mind. And therefore, in all the scenes, I knew intuitively how this character would react and what would be important to her and what her priorities were and what her motivations were and, you know, all of that. So it was a combination. It's always a combination, really, of feeding off what you're getting from the other actors and funneling that through the character that you've created and what her issues and priorities are. Leslie, you were 18 when you starred in the 1965 televised version of the Rodgers and Hammerstein's musical Cinderella. You were working opposite Hollywood legends like Ginger Rogers, Celeste Holm, Joe Van Fleet, and working directly with Richard Rogers, who also executive produced. 
Did the experience feel like a star making turn where you were sort of shot out of a cannon or did you feel like your rising fame from that point forward was more of a slow burn? You know, I didn't think about those things when I was making the the television project. I, I, I was so dedicated to wanting to bring to life my version of the Cinderella story. And I infused it with a kind of reality. And I, I do think that that's why it sort of lasted for as long as it did. I never thought of it as something not real. You know, I bought into the whole story completely and bodied it from that perspective. The aftermath of the success of it didn't really hit me until later. And then I realized, looking back, that it was an incredible shot out of a cannon, you know. I think if I had thought of all of that while doing it and being so young, I probably would have been paralyzed with fear. But because I didn't really have my focus on that, it was just me wanting to do the very, very best job I could possibly do with this beautiful story. Was there someone that sort of shepherded you on set or somebody that was your sort of go-to person there that you felt safe with if you needed to confide any nerves or anything like Honestly, that? Honestly, I think, yeah, I think the director, Charles Dubin and Richard Rogers. Richard Rogers was so incredibly kind to me and, and loving and protective. We shot crazy hours because in those days, after didn't have rules about how many hours you needed time off for and all of that. Sometimes we shot like 20 hours a day and they put Stuart Damon and I in a hotel across the street from CBS and to get like four or five hours sleep. But we were on set and it was some like three in the morning. And he said, if I could get you anything you wanted with his hour, what would it be? And I said, peanut brittle. Like, don't ask. I have no idea why I said that, but I was, you know, obsessed about peanut brittle. He drove somewhere in Hollywood and found me peanut brittle. And then Charlie Dubin, we're starting in my own little corner. I was crying when I was doing it, and he kept having me do it over and over. And, I, and finally he came down from the booth, which was, you know, in a different area in those days than the set. And he came up and whispered to me and said, sweetheart, you're crying so much we can't understand the words. <laughs> And so I thought, oh, well, okay, that's why I have to do it over again. Um, but he didn't admonish me or make me feel ashamed or critiqued, you know. So it was an incredibly loving environment for me. In those days, Leslie, were you like singing live to tape for the special? How was that done? Yes, we were singing live to tape. Mm. That's what we did. Everything was right there, you know, with the mics. And, you know, I mean, when we obviously when we made the recording, we went into a recording studio and did it properly, so to speak. But yeah. It's so special. I feel like that's what they need to be doing right now in this time while like the theater is closed. I feel like they need to be bringing that type of like, because it is, it's like watching theater on television. It's so beautiful. I think some movies have done that. You know, I think they did that on Les Mis, on the movie with Anne Hathaway. People sang live and I think it was so powerful as a result. You know, I think if you're capable of doing that, it's it's a great way to go. Leslie, we love, I mean, we love your iteration of Cinderella. We love the Julie Andrews version. We love the Brandy version. Did you see the the first Broadway cast that did it a couple years ago? And if so, you know, what, what did you think of that? Because then Douglas Carter being sort of massaged and modernized the book a little bit. They brought me to New York to surprise. Um, oh, it was Kiki, Kiki, pa- it was yeah, Kiki Palmer, yeah, wasn't Kiki it? Pa- to surprise them on stage and sing the finale with the cast. And so I did that and it was great. And she was oh, a doll. My honest feeling was she was fabulous. Everybody was great. But I didn't love that they modernized it and that they made it sort of sarcastic or a little bit snarky. I didn't love that. You know, I, I feel like the story is so beautiful and it's interesting it still resonates so strongly with little girls so strongly and some little boys there's something about just waiting to be loved and wanting to be cherished and hoping that this is the one you know there's something in that for all people it seems like and especially young children that is powerful for them and standing sort of true to your own 
hopes and dreams and beliefs, you know? So I think leave it alone. You know, that's my feeling. 100% we are with you. (laughs) So on the heels of the sort of massive success that you experienced with Cinderella, you starred in two live action Disney musicals, The Happiest Millionaire and the one and only genuine original family band. Were you so excited to land these film roles and enter the sort of Disney machine? Or was there a part of you that was anxious that you might then forever be typecast as this beautiful doe-eyed ingenue? No, I was thrilled. And especially because The Happiest Millionaire was, you know, I was honestly... I had to do a really big screen test. They brought me out to to L.A. I was in New York and, you know, put me up in the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I studied the choreography and some of the songs. And we did a full-on hair and makeup test. And then Walt Disney made that final decision. And he, again, he he was an incredible, powerful influence in my early life. There's no question. And I was so honored, you know, to be chosen by him. And it was such a huge production and Greer Garson was playing my mother, you know, and Fred McMurray was playing my father. And, you know, it was, it was very hard work. I worked really, really, really hard, lots of dancing, you know, lots to learn. And, you know, but it was, ex- it was so exciting. And I was really thrilled to be a part of that world. And, and I loved working at Disney. I loved it. It was one of my favorite studio experiences. It wasn't until, again, years later that I realized, oh, some people don't want to see me because they think that's all I do. And so I sort of conscientiously Mm. made a decision to try to branch out and do other kinds of characters. But I personally loved it. It was it's absolutely one of my favorite memories. Were you on contract with a studio at that time, Leslie? Yes, I was under contract to to Walt Disney for two years. Well, I was under contract for more than that, but then he passed away before the second film. And what happened with the second one, the family band is the original one and only original family band is that those movies went out of style. You know, those big sort of period movies, musicals went out of style for that time. And it was the whole Bert Schneider and, you know, much more realistic, much obviously much more realistic and gritty and, you know, a whole other kind of filmmaking became the preferred way to go. And so they stopped doing that for a while. Disney, that is. Your Broadway career began when you were 17 years old in the original production of 110 in the Shade, which, of course, got you seen then for the 1965 Cinderella telecast. After Cinderella, you starred in the famous flop Drat the Cat, which famously ran for just eight performances. Then you had like a break from Broadway and returned in 1997 for the musical review Dream. Is theater still like in your bones when it reopens? Like, is there any part of you that desires to be back on stage? You know, I would say that it's in my sort of bones, if you will, my, 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 (laughs) it's just there for me. And I would love to go back and do something on stage, but it's not my absolute first love because it's really, really, really hard, especially musicals. You know, I was crawling to the end of the run for Dream. <laughs> I was exhausted because it was all dancing and all singing, you know, so that, that it was even harder than any other musical I'd ever done because there was no break, you know. I love the stage. Absolutely love it. And I would really love to do a play, you know. Mm. But doing a musical, it, it's really like an endurance course. It's really, you really have to be in the best shape and the most, you know, there are, I didn't do this, but a lot of performers who are in musicals don't, don't talk during the entire run, during the day. Because it's so, you know, exhausting vocally and certainly physically if you're dancing, which I, of course, love to do still. So... Yeah. Okay, so something we have to ask while we're with you is that, you know, in addition to Drat the Cat, you were also in the Broadway Bound, but it never made their Gone with the Wind musical Scarlet that sort of stopped out of town. And I was like, oh, these are like famous productions. Like, do you have fondness for these productions, even if maybe they weren't big hits? Well, Drat the Cat was, believe it or not, it was a huge success for me (laughs) because I had... (laughs) I did, it was. I got really bad reviews in, in Philadelphia when we opened pre-Broadway. And Lee Strasberg was my teacher. 
And I called him and I was crying and I said, oh my God, I've gotten these horrible reviews. And he took the train out to Philadelphia and he watched the performance and he sort of read me the riot act and he said, I want you to make a serious history of the character. I want you to write it out. I want you to, blah, blah, blah. you know, gave me all these directions. And I did, I did everything he said. And then I came into, into onto broad, you know, we came in to New York and we opened on Broadway. And honestly, I got headlines in the Tribune and the New York Times. And so it was a really big success for me. And I was <laughs> heartbroken, it didn't, didn't last because I loved the character. I loved Joe Layton, the director. I loved choreographer, you know, I loved the show and I was really heart sick, but it didn't last. So that was sad. The, the Gone with the Wind, we did it at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion for two months. And then we went to San Francisco for two months. It was a huge, huge show to move. I mean, just huge. We had a horse. We had the burning of Atlanta. An enormous show to sort of travel with. And as much as I adored playing Scarlet and felt it was the right role for me to be playing at that time, I was not sorry to see that end. It was a very difficult show to to produce, really. Not you know, not for me so much, but for the producers. And again, it was Joe Layton, whom I love, directed it. But it was it was just too much to try to keep afloat. So we're going to stay in the musical vein a little bit, but let's get to it. Of course, the 1982 Blake Edwards comedy classic, Victor Victoria, has you stealing scenes as Norma Cassidy, a blonde mall who has it out for Julie Andrews' man. The story goes that your excellent nightclub number, Chicago, which is one of my favorites, was added after the fact. How in the hell did Blake Edwards hire you for a musical in 1982 and not give you a big song and dance number? You know, in the original script, the character wasn't blonde. She didn't have an accent. She was a very sort of, you know, generic showgirl, chorus girl. I asked if I, you know, I sort of started thinking about all of that with my coach. And, and I came up with this idea that she lived in the Lower East Side with 14 other siblings. And she always had to yell. And that's where she had her accent from. And that she wanted to be a movie star. And she read all the movie magazines and copied Jean Harlow's makeup. And I came up with this whole character. And he loved it and sent his wig maker and all these, you know, his production designer, costume designer person to my house. And we kind of created this character. And I don't even know if he knew much about my singing and dancing past because one day we were, he always made all the crew, the, the, the painters, the set builders, the actors, everyone had to come to dailies, which were shown on a huge screen because he liked to see where the, the real laughs were with real people. So everybody was in dailies and he leaned over to me and he said, do you still sing? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, do you still dance? And I said, I do. And he said, I want to see more of Norma. I want to see more of her. I said, great. <laughs> then he brought <laughs> Leslie Brickus and Henry Mancini in from California to write this fantastic number. We rehearsed it for about three weeks, and that was that. It's so good. The thing that comes down to pull the costume. I mean, the whole thing, the whole production is I so know. brilliant. I know. It was extraordinary. I mean, yeah. Do you remember what your Oscar clip was, Leslie? Where my what? What you're like, what they showed at the Oscars before no, they announced your name. I don't. We had a guess, but we were just curious if you like remembered what it was. I think I was in an altered state. I'm not kidding. I'm sure. <laughs> I was truly not in my body. What's also amazing about the year you were nominated is that you were also up against other women that were doing comedy, you know, you know, but like with pathos, but like, you know, it was you and the women from Tootsie and it was like, that is like, now I feel like those types of performances aren't, I don't know, you know, comedy is always tougher for people to take seriously, even though it's so hard. It's such a great performance. It's so fucking funny. Thank you. So proud of it. Uh, I guess on the heels of that, I'm curious if you ever thought about your work, I mean, specifically in Victor Victoria, but I mean, in so much of it, like really seems to resonate with gay audiences or, you know, the queer LGBTQ community. Like, do you feel like you have a queer or gay sensibility? I'm not sure what that would be, but I certainly have an enormous audience of LGBTQ people. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I'm thrilled and it's the best audience to have, in my opinion. I mean, it's so, everybody's so expressive and so, you know, acknowledging. 
I think that, you know, starting with Cinderella maybe and then Victor Victoria and Clue, those are very iconic women characters that are not your average mom making cookies in the kitchen. So there's a there's an attraction, I think, to that to the glamour, to the a princess and a you know, the transformation from you know, little duckling to this princess and then you know, the clue character is so sort of tough and, you know, don't with me, you know. But in the in the form that they come, they're sort of iconic women characters in a way, you know. And I think that's what sort of generated that response from that section of people. And I and then it kind of just continued, you know, it sort of came with me, which is so great. I love it so much. I know we were trying to think of what it was when we were sort of identifying it. And we were like, but also the Muppets, but also Desperate Housewives. But uh, there's just so much work that seems to resonate with us as gay people that is, was a, sort of a beautiful line to draw or more of an arc maybe throughout your career. That's interesting. I never thought of Desperate Housewives as fitting into that. That it's, it's interesting to hear that. I mean, I get the Muppets. I get that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Will and Grace. Will and Grace, for yeah. sure. And that character, yeah, you know, it's like these characters are sort of emblematic of particular women characters, I think, that are, are somewhat lar- larger than life, if you will, you know, and have such attitude. Yeah, and like style. I feel like you bring style and panache. Love to, that. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> So, Nick, again, as we were going through your work, obviously, it seems you have a distinct connection to Julie Andrews, not only because of the Cinderella connection, but of course, Victor Victoria, but also that you auditioned to be Liesl in the Sound of Music movie. Do you have a relationship with her? What has that been like? We had a fantastic time on Victor Victoria. She's everything you've ever heard about her and everything you've read about her. She's she's so full of joy and generosity and loves to laugh and has just a great time hard worker beyond, beyond. So we had just a beautiful time on Victor Victoria, you know, just couldn't have been better. And when Blake passed away, and I and I got to see them on occasion, but when Blake passed away, she asked me to speak at the memorial at the Academy, which was such an incredible honor. I barely got through it without crying, but, or maybe I did. And then we've kept in touch, holidays and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm in touch with her stepdaughter. You know, I, she lives in New York now, and I don't get to see her, but I'm simply one of her biggest, biggest, biggest fans. Damien and I have a real scope and knowledge of your career, but one of the great discoveries of this interview for me has been the 1984 Alan Rudolph movie, Choose Me which has you starring as Eve, a former call girl who now runs her own bar and calls a love line every night. For our listeners that aren't familiar with the movie, the noirish dramedy about intertwining sex lives in Los Angeles has this incredible Teddy Pendergrass score throughout the entire film. This incredible cast that includes Keith Carradine, Genevieve Bujold, Radon Chong, and John Larroquette. Entertainment Weekly actually named it one of the 50 best independent films of all time, and I was obsessed with it. It's all these sort of wet streets and foggy lamp posts. I loved the sort of weird style and how surprising all of it was. How did you manage to sort of get that very specific tone for that movie? How did you get that right? Well, I remember when I met Alan Rudolph and Carolyn Pfeiffer, the producer, we met in those days, we met at the Beverly Wilshire Bar, which is very smoky and sort of, you know, has an old older kind of a 40s feel at that time. I'm sure it's been redone. It was my first meeting with them, and, and Alan was, it is, was and is very seductive. And I don't mean that he follows through with that, but his just whole way of being is very seductive. And, you know, he talked to me about the character and talked to me about this, this sort of setting, and, and I was in. I just wanted to do it. I wanted to work with him. I, I had a big fight with my agent at the time because he didn't want me to do it because it was coming off the heels of Victor Victoria. It was a small film, but I, I just knew. I just knew that it was going to be an important film in that independent world. So... When I got together with the costume designer and we sort of, Tracy Tynan, we created this sort of vintage 40s feel for this character that she kind of has this 40s glamour and, you know, lives in this in this apartment in, in Hollywood that's, that's kind of vintage-y. And, you know, so the whole thing sort of 
to become on its own, you know, and I loved playing that character. I loved it, loved it, loved it. And the interesting thing about what you talked about, the street scene, you know, we were shooting that one night at like, I don't know, two or three in the morning in downtown LA. And Alan, we play Teddy Pendergrass's song on these big speakers on the set all the time so that we would stay in that kind of mood. Mm -hmm. And I remember I came out to him and I was not in the scene. And I said, God, I just want to dance to this. And he said, you do? And I said, I do. And he said, well, why don't you start there end there and do whatever you want. And I did. So great. <laughs> it was so exciting and freeing and fun. And, you know, a lot of it was had that, we didn't improvise really, but it had that sort of spontaneous feeling. Because he played music on the set, which most directors won't do because of the sound and this and that. But it was, it, it maintained that sort of tenor of the movie throughout. It was a joy, and I was very proud of it. Still am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a beautiful discovery. I highly recommend. It's streaming right now, by the way, I believe on Amazon, so everybody should check it out. Oh, definitely. Okay, Leslie Ann Warren, we have entered the part of our show. It is the rapid fire section. This is really rapid fire for Ann and I because we are throwing a lot of non sequiturs at. You can take your time if you need to. Okay. Okay. You worked with the Muppets several times on The Muppet Show. Can you describe what it's like to act, sing, and flirt opposite a person, in most cases a man, on the floor beneath you with their hand up a puppet? Okay. Well, just like I believed I was Cinderella, I fell in love with those Muppets. I didn't <laughs> think about the man underneath. And I'm not even kidding. I really didn't. I fell in love with them. I was afraid of the beast. I just was there. And I think that's my, my, you know, my biggest sort of, I don't know what to call it, but one of my talents is that I believe. And in a way, it's childlike, but I use it to my advantage. Yeah, you, you were into that pig when you were as flirting at like the tiki bar or whatever. You're like, <laughs> you're flirting. And I was oh, like, yeah. oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Leslie, you start as Dana Lambert on season five of the original Mission Impossible TV series. Has famed Scientologist Tom Cruise called you to make a cameo in any of the films? No. <laughs> what the hell? What, what in the, the hell? actual hell? Exactly. No. And I'm such a huge fan of his. So come on, if you're listening. Yeah, no, he has not. Tom Cruise, longtime listener. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I get it. Leslie, your episode of Shelley Duvall's Fairy Tale Theater co stars Shirley MacLaine's estranged daughter, Sachi Parker, and icon Zelda Rubinstein. So go with us on this. If you were getting married, which of those three women, Shelley, Sachi, or Zelda, would you want to be your maid of honor? Shelley. She's still, you know, she's. Such an original and so unique and... Love it. Yeah, Shelly. Crazy question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for indulging us. We're just going to keep going. Okay, you're in the first season of Desperate Housewives, and then, of course, you recurred throughout as Susan's mother, Sophie. Many infamous stories have come from that set. On a scale of one being healthy to ten being toxic, how toxic was that set for you and like, your experience? Is there a number past ten? <gasps> oh, wow. I was not expecting that answer. <laughs> this one goes to 11. Oh, wow. I thought you were going to be like, oh, for me, it was easy breezy. Wow. So it was, it was toxic. <laughs> I don't want to say, you know what? I'm not going to use the word toxic because that's like, actually, it's funny, but it's not, not accurate. It was really, really, really challenging. There was a lot of stuff going on and it was deeply challenging. You're a hoot on it. I was so glad that you were on it. And Valerie Harper got to be your sister, right? I mean, it was I know, my sister. I know that was so great. And, and I loved, you know, I had a great time doing that character. It was just, it was just challenging. So, of course, you starred as Lois Lane in the TV version of the musical, It's a Bird, It's a Plane, and auditioned for the same role in the Christopher Reeve Superman movie. Terry Hatcher, of course, played Lois Lane in the ABC series Lois and Clark. And you, as we said, played Terry's mother on Desperate Housewives. Do you have a fondness for the character of Lois Lane? And question, did they get your permission to include your screen test on the DVD of that special feature? Did they ask you? They did. They did. You had to sign a release. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay, good. No, I mean, I had, you know, I certainly wanted to be in the movie. I was very, you know, they flew me to London. I did a screen test, you know, and all those other wonderful ladies. And, you know, I really would have loved to have been in the movie, but I didn't have any particular sort of relationship with Lois Lane, although it was really fun to do it in the musical. It sort of satirized it. Okay, Leslie, you were apparently slated to play Will Ferrell's mom and stepbrothers, but had to drop out and were replaced with Mary Steenburgen. When you were up and coming, which actresses were you consistently in the audition room with? Like, was Steenburgen somebody you were often in the room with? Yes, Mary Steenburgen and I were Susan Sarandon, Barbara Hershey. Mm. Um, I remember being in a room with Michelle Pfeiffer, you know, in an audition space with her. And, and, you know, she's younger and, you know, all of that. But, yeah, those, those are the women that come to mind. Sometimes Christine Lati, you know. All great actresses. Yeah. Okay, one of Damien and I's mutual favorites, Celeste Holm, played your fairy godmother in Cinderella and, of course, was the original Edo Annie in Oklahoma on Broadway. Did she impart any theatrical or old Hollywood wisdom while you were doing Cinderella? She did. She told me to stop frowning (laughs) (laughs) and to not smile so much. I'm not even kidding. She said, you're going to make lines in your forehead. You're going to make lines in this. I'm not kidding. She said, just try to have a more placid sort of <laughs> expression. I mean, it didn't work for me, and that was not something I was able to, to utilize. But she was very conscientious of, you know, the face, the face. I mean, I remember, you know, back in those days, that whole thing of washing your face in the morning with ice water. Yes. She was a big proponent of that before coming to this. It's so fascinating because I think of her, I mean, I love her face, but I think of her as like a great character actress who maybe wouldn't have been as concerned with those things. But, you know, I love her. (laughs) You've played moms to the following people. Ashton Kutcher in Jobs, Maggie Gyllenhaal in Secretary, Terry Hatcher in Desperate Housewives, Julia Roberts in Baja, Oklahoma, Katie Holmes in Teaching Mrs. Tingle, and Mary McCormick in In Plain Sight. If you had a body to bury, which of your on-screen kids would you call to help you? (laughs) Mary McCormick. She is so strong and so, you know, rolls up her sleeves and will do anything and and jumps in. And I love her. I love, you know, I love many of those children of mine. But but Mary is like, okay, let's do it. Let's get it done. You know, she's she's a real trooper. She seems cool, like level headed and pragmatic. She is cool. She is cool and level headed and pragmatic and funny and warm. I adore her. You sang and danced with Carol Burnett on the first season of her landmark variety series, The Carol Burnett Show. How did you prepare for that experience? And can you describe that week of rehearsal in three words? (laughs) No, Uh, (laughs) not three words, but she was, she's so fabulous. But, but because my, uh, my, I had, I think several numbers and then a number with her and You know, for me, I was a dancer. I had come from Broadway. It was what I knew to do. Go to rehearsal, learn what I have to do, and then rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it until you feel like you're doing what you want to do with it. So I brought my most professional Broadway dancer, performer self to the the rehearsal. And of course, Carol is such a doll. You've sang and danced in many of your film roles, as we've mentioned, Cinderella, Victor Victoria, songwriter, Baja, Oklahoma, but not so much recently. Can you tell us, were there ever any big movie musicals that got away? I don't think that there were any specific roles or movies that got away. I know Rob Marshall has talked to me for years, saying that he wants to do something with me, you know, and that would be a dream come true. Daniels has said the same thing to me. I think that I don't think currently there are any movie musicals that, that have been right for me that I feel have gone to somebody else, so to speak. Yeah. I was imagining that in the 80s when they were shopping around Chicago that you should have been up for Roxy on, you know, on the heels of Victor Victoria. You know, I didn't know that they were shopping it around at that time. You know, I, it was not something I was privy to. I know that when Rob was doing his version, that we had conversations about me being one of the uh, cell block. Mary Murderesses. Yeah, one of the murderesses. Cell block tango, yeah. Yeah, cell block tango girls. But he felt that that was not important enough for me to do. So I was complimented, but of course I was sad that I wasn't part of that movie. And then I was 
you know, simply too old to play Roxy anymore. But if it's meant to be at this point, we'll come to Got to believe that, right? Absolutely. 100%. Leslie Ann Warren, thank you so much for bearing with us through all of the technical difficulties. We really, really appreciate it. This is very important to both of us. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you so much. You both are great. And I really appreciate your sincerity and passion. Oh, geez. Okay, so everything about that interview was, as I said before, like a total dream come true. But the thing that stuck with me and I like kept being reminded of all week in anticipation of the episode launching today was the moment she told us that Celeste Holm told her not to like <laughs> smile or frown. Because one, I couldn't believe it. Two, I loved hearing my best friend be like, well, I just, I love Celeste Holmes' face, but I just assume that because she's a character, she didn't care about those things. And Leslie Ann Warren being like, oh no, she did. And also because like Ann and I have had this running gag since, I don't know, me and Ann reconnected in 11 years ago and we watched Oklahoma the movie, which Celeste Holm is not in, but she was in the Broadway production of Oklahoma. And therefore we had this ongoing joke about, not, it wasn't a joke, Ann kept being like, Celeste Holm is dead. She died in I don't know what year, but Ann kept killing her for year after year after year. She died in 2012. So for two years of us knowing, of being reconnected, she kept dying. I was like positive that Celeste Holm had died. And it wasn't even a joke. It was like, no, I know I read her obit in the New York Times. Like, I know that she's passed. It was like a, it was a whole thing. Celeste Holm is very important to us. That being said, she is also like a great actress and one of the greats, <laughs> yeah, honestly. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> but I was just shocked. I was so into her being like a woman that used an ice bath on her face. Now, Damien didn't tell me what he was going to say for the outro. Let me tell you the, the takeaway <laughs> that I loved so much. So, you know, we really spend a lot of time on our research. If you know the show, you know, we try to do our best to really put together thoughtful questions that are specific <laughs> to us. Now, we spent a lot of time on Leslie and Warren because it was very important to us that we covered as much ground as we could. She's still working. She has a huge career. I will tell you, I, I have a home printer. I printed out the questions. We were five minutes before the interview started. I was getting my computer set up, getting the ring light that Damien generously purchased for me <laughs> set up. And I just wanted to make sure that there was not something I had missed that was going to go unsaid. <laughs> and I was going through the IMDb and I saw it and I texted Damien 911. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I thought someone had died and that the interview would have to be canceled. <laughs> Turns out I had missed Leslie Ann Warren's episode of Shelley Duvall's Fairy Tale Theater, starring Sachi Parker and Zelda Rubenstein, who is much discussed on this podcast. <laughs> now, first of all, Sachi Parker is very important to Damien and I because there's this great interview with her where she's talking about being Shirley <laughs> MacLaine's estranged daughter. We're going to link out to it. It's a, it's outrageous. <laughs> anyway, so I added that one in last minute, and I love that Leslie Ann Warren, in response to my question, said, very weird question. <laughs> and <laughs> she was totally serious weirded out but to me it was a 911 we added it in that's the kind of behind the scenes action that you get here also it was very important that we put it in also folks you know rapid fire is sort of an opportunity to address all you know what it is it's an opportunity to address all the credits that we didn't get in the meat of the interview and also yeah. an opportunity to see if we can get them to dish a little bit like i don't need like salacious and mean-spirited gossip but like if you have a, like a tidbit from like set on set or old hollywood juice or lesbian yeah. gossip from the 90s i need yeah. it and i have to say like i was totally expecting leslie and warren to have no response to the desperate housewives thing to be like i was a guest star and it was totally fine and she was like oh but what surpasses 10 and i was like oh and i'm gonna say these are my words not leslie and warren she didn't tell us anything about this yes. but i'm gonna say that it's because she worked so closely with terry hatcher and like i don't want to i'm not vilifying terry hatcher i just think that yes. like she and nicolette sheridan it were all of the drama orbits around them and mark cherry who apparently like hit nicolette sheridan <laughs> on the head so it comes from the top mark cherry is a problem I was also into talking to Leslie about like the gayness of her work in general and her being like, is Desperate Housewives like gay canon? And I was like, it is. Every time, every episode is named after a Sondheim song, Leslie. So yes. I feel high. Oh, I love her. Reliving so, this episode. I love her so much. I love her so much. What a fucking thrill that was. Also, if you haven't seen Clue, please tell me. I'll mail you a DVD if it's not streaming, which I think it is. But it is so 
wonderful. If you're a fan of Leslie Ann Warren, Eileen Brennan, Madeline Kahn, Michael McKean, Tim Curry, I mean, it is phenomenal cast. Also, can you please, can you, if you have not seen Clue, can you DM us? Because I need to know who of our listeners hasn't seen Clue, because like that is interesting knowledge to me, because to me, it's a movie that everyone has seen. Absolutely. And like, also my siblings made fun of me for loving Clue. Like they were like, that movie's not good. So like oh, now, interesting. now that it has a cult following, I feel very yeah. vindicated, but I watched it like every day from yeah. being like in, you know, fourth grade through I watch it twice a year at least. We're usually around Halloween and then another time. So point being, if you haven't seen Clue, we want to know because we want to we want to get a poll, you know, like, yeah. have you have you seen Clue? One of the things that Damien and I have been talking about privately a lot is about like singing live or being dubbed. And I just want to bring that up because it's going to come up in future episodes that are forthcoming. And I loved the conversation with Leslie and Warren because when we revisited Cinderella, it was so cool to understand that they were singing live to tape on the Cinderella broadcast, but then of course they recorded the cast recording. And like she said, if you can do it and you're good enough to do it, I think you should do it because it creates an intimacy. I disagree that they should have done it in Les Mis, which was terrible and I hate Tom Hooper and he's a disgrace. But I just want to talk about it because I also am an advocate for certain people being dubbed in other scenarios, which again, will be forthcoming in future episodes. And I just love the conversation about like who should be singing, who shouldn't, should you sing live, should you not in a musical movie? Kiki Palmer sure sang live to tape. Grease Live, one of the greatest things that's ever happened. Okay, folks, so you know this thing we've been doing where we are connecting this week's guest to next week's guest. So we're ready to do it. And it's a pretty it's a pretty direct one. So we are connecting one of Leslie and Warren's co-stars, Professor Plum, that would be Christopher Lloyd, to next week's guest. Should I tell them the movie? Should I be or should I be ambiguous about it? I think that, I mean, he has such an extensive career. I think you need to give the movie or at least say what the genre of Christopher Lloyd movie it is. Okay, so this is like a coming of age sort of Disney or Disney adjacent movie about camp where Christopher Lloyd is sort of the one of the lone adults and it's about camp, summer camp. So I think that that is pretty crystal clear. Take it, run with it, and find out who next week's guests are. We have just littered this outro with clues beautiful people please if you want to keep this show going and you know put us in more ears the best thing you can do is leave us a review on itunes a written review would be so kind as always you can leave an emoji you can leave the name of an actress you can say what episode you loved four or five stars will do if it's less than that send us a dm send us the constructive criticism that you're so desperate to deliver but a review on the apple itunes podcast app is the best thing you can do for us so please would you be so kind while you're doing that, follow us on social media. That would be, I guess, our Facebook, but really Twitter and Instagram. You can find me at Damian Bellino, and you can find my dumb cohort over here at Rodeman. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. You might know her from is produced by us, Anne Rodeman and Damian Bellino. We two sitting in front of our computers, staring at one another, you listening to us in your ears. Where do you listen to us? Tell us where you listen to us. In the bathroom? On the subway? On a bike? In the kitchen? Where? We also want to thank our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment. That's the great Jason Jude Hill and the great Daniel Sears. And all the editing you hear is also by Daniel. And extra special thanks to Gang. Their music underscores each and every one of our episodes. You can stream and download Gang's music on iTunes or wherever you choose to listen to music. Can I tell you that me and the dog were having a conversation yesterday and I talk to her constantly now and I was just like screaming in her face. Like I was like, (laughs) you have to be Sarah Brown. I'm Adelaide. (laughs) And I was like, you have to be married. I was like, you have to be Mary and Prune. I'm Mrs. Prune. That You win in that scenario. <laughs> it's like, you're Lori. I'm Ado Annie. Sorry. Sorry. And then I told her she could be Lori and Ado Annie, but I'm Aunt Eller still. It was cool. Is she Audrey or Seymour? I know she's Ronette, but if she's Audrey or Seymour, who is she and who are you? I think she's Audrey. Yeah. You're Mushnick then. How would you like...